Thanks for joining us for our time of message today, this first Sunday in, in June. Uh, this uh, spring summertime is one of my favorite seasons of the, the year, especially driving around in rural places like, like we live to, to see the, the, the corn uh, just, just popping through the ground. It's, it's amazing to me that they use these huge pieces of equipment to be able to plant seed so orderly and in, in, in straight rows uh, in, a, in a certain population that they can set with the, the machinery. And it's just amazing that all those little corn plants come popping through, all the little soybeans come popping through. Uh, our youth pastor recently planted a, a garden too, and he had a little bit of a surprise because uh, uh, he had, I think he had planted some, some green beans, and before they had popped through, um, it appears that the, the squirrels had a, had a little bit of fun and uh, they replanted uh, some of his, his items for him. So when the, the beans came up, they, they weren't in a straight row anymore. They just sort of random scattered all over the place. But it's not amazing that, that, that miracle of, of life that God brings about from, from seed time into to plants, to leaves, to blossoms, to, to fruit. That's the God that we trust in today, to do that in us spiritually as well. And we need to be paying attention to the, the seeds that have been planted and what he is watering today and, and what he wants to harvest today in us as well. So thanks for joining us as we uh, dig into to God's word today in our series of uh, Unlimiting God. And today we're going to talk about limiting God through disobedience. So, obedience and disobedience. And we begin to learn at a, a very young age that there's a difference, isn't there? We learn that when we comply with a, a request or a rule that, that life rolls differently and hopefully smoother. Even at first, we don't understand the, the letter of the law. And it doesn't take us long to catch on to the fact that that there are often consequences to our, our failures. And when we don't yield to authority, most of the time we're gonna get caught. We may get away with it once or, or maybe twice, but eventually things are gonna catch up with us and there's a price to pay for our repeated offenses. And there's a difference too between acting uh, disobedient because of, of ignorance. We, we simply didn't know the, the rules. We, we weren't aware of them versus that open, intentionally choosing to be disobedient. And you know what I'm, I'm talking about. So before we unpack this uh, topic today of limiting God through our disobedience, would you, would you join me in a word of prayer before we dig into God's word? God, I, I pray that you would help us now not to take your word lightly or flippantly, um, only as a suggestion or a, a long historical story, but as life-giving truth that is reliable and effective and needed for, for our lives today. We commit this time to you. Speak your words through me, Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start with our same orientation point that we've been using in this series of a couple of verses in Psalm 78. And Asaph and, and God partner up here to, to write this psalm because they know that we have short memories. And the idea, the goal, the longing of the heart of God is to enable us to experience life by truth and through truth. Because the alternative is, is being dead and managing our, our, our deadness, our days and our nights by deception and through disobedience. So let's start out with a couple of verses here in Psalm 78, verses 8 and 10. And again, he's reflecting back uh, for the, the generations to come on what happened in that wilderness experience with the Israelites. That they would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. 
That, that's his desire for those current readers of this psalm as they worship, that they would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law. Now that they take this journey from Egyptian slavery into the promised land. And it could have been accomplished in a, in a very short amount of time, about a year or so. But as we track that journey, that last leg of that trip from Mount Sinai to the, the border of the promised land, the, the scripture is very clear. It should have taken 11 days and it takes them 11 months. And then when the promised land is literally right there in their sight, they can, they can physically see it with, with their eyes. Fear and unbelief of God's promises cause God's people to, to wander around in the desert for another 38 years. And it's not just the physical wandering around the territory but many of them, not all, but many of them are spiritually wandering all over the place, slipping and doing whatever their little hearts desire, not worshiping God or following the laws that he gave them. So probably that the majority of God's people were ignoring him during that season. They were disregarding Moses' leadership, and a whole generation of them had to die off then before God was going to allow them to enter into uh, the, the promised land. And that comes under the leadership of Joshua. And that's what we're going to look at today a little bit. We're going to jump ahead. If you want to open up your scripture, get your, get your Bible, get your device, and turn to, to Joshua, the end of the book. And Joshua, um, these are going to be his farewell comments in chapter 23 and 24 of the, the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. These are his farewell comments after being the, the leader of, of God's people, but doing it well. Joshua finishes well, having taken hold of the promised land as God had commanded. And Joshua wants that obedience and that blessing then to, to continue on into the future. And so he's, he's getting to the end of his life, and these are, in a sense, his his final comments to God's people. We're going to pick it up in, in Joshua chapter 23. We're going to start at, at uh, verse 14. Verse 14. This is Joshua reflecting. He says, Now I am about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises of the Lord your God has failed. Imagine. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as every good promise of the Lord has come true, so the Lord will bring on you all the evil he has threatened you until he has destroyed you from this good land he has given you. If you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you, and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. And then chapter 24 begins that Joshua assembled all the, the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And then Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to, to you. And then he's going to take them through a, a real quick remembrance, a, a history lesson here of, of their family bush, of the, of the tree. He's going to talk about Abraham and how God made promises to, to Abraham and gave him many descendants. He gave him Isaac, and then it says, Isaac, to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. And then Jacob went down to, to Egypt, and then he raised up Moses and Aaron. And he reminds them that he's the one. I afflicted the Egyptians, but I brought you out. He enabled them to, to cross the, the Red Sea. You lived in the desert, but I brought you to the promised land, to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the, the Jordan. 
And even though they fought against you, Scripture says, I gave them into your hands, and you took possession of the land. Again, he's reminding them of what the good things that God's promises came true. He blessed you again and again. I delivered you. I gave them into your hands. And then uh, verse 13 of chapter 24, I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from the vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. So Joshua takes them through the, this Cliff Notes version of, of history, reminding them all the things that God had been done. He had been completely and utterly faithful to them. And now they had finally got it after that generation of, of unbelievers, of unfaithful, of disobedient people died off. So here are some of his final comments. We're going to pick it up here in, in verse 14 of chapter 24 in Joshua. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in the land you are living. But as for me and my household, Joshua says, I will serve, we will serve the, the, the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in this land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. Because he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end to you. After he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, he drew up for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak tree near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Then Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. Now, I hope you are picking up on the, the hopeful sincerity of, of Joshua's words here, that they are simply more than just uh, reflective ramblings of an old man about the past and sentimental hopes for a, a nice future. There is a call here for a renewed commitment of God's people, a charge for the people to be loyal and dedicated to the Lord God and, and no other gods. God has done all he needs to do. He always has, and he wants to remind them God is going to continue to be faithful as you are faithful. Now, it is up to the people to choose. Now, I want to walk you through four details of, of choice here that Joshua leads the people through. Because first of all, Joshua urges them. He wants them to make a real choice, 
a real choice. In verse 15, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Joshua is calling the Israelites to make a, a real choice in that very moment. He doesn't say, well, okay, I'm going to present this, go home, discuss it as a family, reflect on it a bit and, and get back to me. Uh, go home and, and pray over it and see what, what you want to do. No, he says, this day, choose whom you are going to, to serve. You, you know the alternatives. It's either God or these, these false gods. It's either God or, or yourself. Today, declare your, your choice to rely on that rock-solid, always true, always defendable, unfailing, good God. Or go the way of the, the world. Or keep falling back on your continual weakness and failings and disobedience. As we walk the Christian faith today, sometimes we can reduce it to a single decision point and forget about the journey. We, we've heard the, the gospel message. Um, we've, we've walked up front at the meeting. We, we did the little exercise in Sunday school or, or VBS. Uh, we raised our hand. We, we prayed the, the, the prayer to accept Jesus as our Lord and, and Savior, but you know, that, that, that first decision has to be followed up with, with many other confirming decisions along the, the way to choose to continue to follow in God's way because we are, we are living creatures. We are not static. We need to continue to, to live and, and choose. And Jesus challenged the people in his time, in his teaching too, to, to make a real decision to make a choice because the choice will affect all of your life and each choice affects the course of our, our lives. He, he reduces it down to, in a sense, the, the very basics, the, the big picture basics in Matthew 6. He says, no one can serve two masters. You just can't. He says either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then, you know this final comment he, he makes here? You cannot serve both God and money. See, Jesus knew what had gripped our hearts and what has gripped our world. And it's just as true, maybe even more true today, than it was back in, in Jesus' day when he gave that, that message that the, the material things can, can grip us so tightly that we worship them and put their worth above the value of, of God. But when it comes to relationship with, with God, we need to make a real choice. Uh, second thing, we also need to make a, a responsible choice, a responsible choice. So one of the books that we're using, the, the one that was written 50 years ago called Limiting God, uh, the, the author says this, choosing to serve God isn't simply a casual commitment or a pleasant procedure. It is first of all a realization that, that I am dealing with a holy God. Now, it, it would have been easy for that, that crowd back in that day for just to listen to, to Joshua. Um, after all, uh, we know that he's not long for this earth. He's going to die soon. And, and who's really going to hold us to the, uh, this promise if, if he's dead and gone? Just say what Josh wants to hear and, and let's get things moving t today. But Here's the fact of the matter, that, that Joshua wanted the, the people to make a, a, a responsible choice. Not for his sake, but in light of the recognition of who God is. Recall what we just read. Joshua reminded them that he is a holy God and that he is a jealous God. Now, holiness is not in our everyday language. It's, 
mostly used in, in Bible language, but it, it has to be doing has to do with being set apart. The, the Hebrew literally is is cut off, cut off from from everything else uh, around it. And so when we think of God being holy, it, it is not just one of His characteristics. Holiness describes the, the very essence of, of God. He is completely cut off from everything else that, that we know in, in the created order. And this is what I, I mean by that, because we can use holy to describe all his other attributes. He is holy in his love. His love is completely set apart from the, the, the kind of love that, that we have. He is, he is holy in his mercy. He is holy in his, in his justice, in his power, in his wisdom, in his patience. He, he is holy in his anger and his grace. He is holy in faithfulness. He is holy in compassion. Every attribute that you can think of that, that God has, it is holy. It is set apart, is different, completely different than, than what we know. So, why should this matter? Why should the holiness of God matter to us? Uh, maybe even more than it did to those Old Testament Israelites. Here's what uh, pastor and author Paul Tripp uh, says about, about this in an article I, I found. That the holiness of God sits at the, the center of the grand narrative of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he gives some uh, some contrasts here. Without the holiness of God, there would be no moral law to which every human being is responsible. Without the holiness of God, there would be no divine anger with sin. Without the holiness of God, there would be no perfect son sent as an acceptable sacrifice for sin. Without the holiness of God, there would have been no vindication of the resurrection. Without the holiness of God, there would be no final defeat of Satan. Without the holiness of God, there would be no hope of a new heaven and earth where holiness will reign over us and in us forever. See that? That's what holiness is all about. And so then, with that picture in mind of the holiness of God, does it make sense then for, for Joshua to also remind the, the people and remind us that, that that holy God is a jealous God? Because for us sinful humans, we think about jealousy, and, and that's a sin, right? It, it, it's the desire to have something that doesn't belong to us. We get jealous that that person gets the attention. Or when she gets the award or the, the promotion, when he gets the, the girlfriend. But here's the, the fact of the matter. Worship and praise and honor and adoration belong to God alone. For only he is truly worthy of it. God is rightly jealous then when our worship goes someplace else. When our, our worship, our praise, our, our honor, our adoration is given to, to false gods, to idols, to earthly gods. Joshua wants them to know that you need to make a real choice, but in that it needs to be a responsible choice to accept God on his terms for who he is and not what we want to morph him into. So in order to do that, then, we have to make a, a third thing here is a repentant choice. A repentant choice. Verse 23 of chapter 24 is, Throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, repentance has two important parts. It has to do with turning away, turning away from the gods that you have been worshiping, and turning toward, yielding your heart to the, the Lord and serving Him. 
But too often, our, our default is we, we take the worldly way. We give in to the, the sin that is within. And we want to take time to, you know, carefully consider and to, to readjust and to reacclimate the, the way that we think and act. We want to uh, slowly wean ourselves from the old to the new. And honestly, though, what we really want to, to maintain, isn't it, is our control over the situation in our lives. And we like our version of comfort too often. Read another article online uh, this week, uh, coming from Decision Magazine out of the Billy Graham Association. And uh, Billy Graham's grandson, Will, is a part of that group. And, and he travels all over the world sharing the gospel, just like his grandpa did. And this is what he wrote in a very recent article. He said, I've sensed a change in recent, recent years. Many people seem to want Jesus as Savior while ignoring Jesus as Lord. They want the surety of eternity in heaven, but they feel no compulsion, no heart change toward the repentance that is repeatedly commanded in Scripture. So they are happy to continue a life indiscernible from the world. However, we're called to so much more. And he quotes Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And then he points back to, to Billy, to, to Grandpa Billy. My grandfather once said, repentance, submission, obedience. Repentance, submission, obedience. These are the steps we must take for God to fill us with his spirit so that we can become more like Christ. Do you hear what Paul is, is telling us there? That you can't have it both ways. We can't hang on to the, the old dead life when we've been given new life in Christ. They are incompatible. I uh, want to give you another little glimpse into the, the Ford household. Uh, when one of our, our girls, um, who wishes to remain anonymous, uh, was in eighth grade, her science project was to, to train mice. It was her science uh, presentation project. And we told her from the start, now don't get attached. Uh, it, it's just a mouse. Once this is done, then the, the mouse is going to go. But she named it, and she treasured Marvin. But when uh, Marvin didn't last too much longer past the science project, um, escaping its labors of running that cardboard maze for food and drink, tears were shed. And, and <laughs> the, the, since it was winter here in, in the Midwest with frozen ground, we, we couldn't do a proper burial. So, um, you can uh, just imagine where Marvin ended up, right? Yes, uh, in our freezer. And that's still where he resides currently today, right next to the rainbow sherbet. And you read the little tag there? Can you, I don't know if it's big enough, but it says, uh, Marvin, do not throw away. Now, why is it that we don't want to let go of the old, dead stuff in our lives? It serves absolutely no useful purpose. It takes up space where other good things could be. But we want to hang on to those, those memories that we've made near and dear to us sometimes. Another quote from Paul Tripp, Pastor Paul. We have a problem. Sin doesn't always appear sinful to us. You hear this? We have a problem. Sin 
doesn't always appear sinful to us. Often it's attractive and magnetic. It's only in the face of the holiness of God that you fully realize that sin is more than just a list of bad behaviors and more than breaking a set of abstract rules. Rather, sin is a disastrous condition of the heart that, that causes us to willingly and repeatedly rebel against the authority of God and do what we were never intended to do. Joshua calls people to a, a real choice, a responsible choice, and a repentant choice. And, and finally, he wants the people to, to talk back, to participate in that. And so he makes it a recorded choice. So that after Josh has been taken home to heaven, he doesn't want the people to forget that day to do what they said they were going to do in per perpetuity into the future. He doesn't want it to just last a, a week or a year, but that obedience would be the trend rather than the exception for generations to come. So in verse 26 and 27, he says, Joshua recorded all these things in the book of the law. And then he takes a stone, he, he creates a memorial so that they can keep telling, they can see it, and they can be reminded of the, the, the commitment that they made. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against you. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Uh, unfortunately, our, our memories are not that much better than the Old Testament Israelites, are they? Choosing God involves our, our whole being, though. It, it involves our head and our heart, our soul, our, our will. And choosing, it challenges our, our, our mind. And if we truly repent of our sin, there there has to be an, an intellectual change of what is in our mind and what we put in it. But there's more than just this mental maneuvering. There has to be a change in our hearts as well. The emotions are going to be tested. And the things of God will break our heart instead of the, the stuff all around us that consumed us previously. But the, the will, our will also has to come along and cooperate with our, our head and, and our heart. Willing obedience is a must. And we have to let go of the, that default of the sinful stuff in our lives and with God's help, claim the, the new, claim the, the living, and abandon the, the, the dead. But friends, let's be mindful of, of how often we limit God by our disobedience. But we don't have to stay there. We don't have to stay stuck in our natural-born patterns. We can't accomplish this choice on our own. But God has set the stage. It's why Jesus came to earth to, to live the perfect life that we wouldn't and to die to pay the price that we couldn't to release us from the powers of Satan and to pay the penalty due to God for our sin. So I, I invite you, I urge you, even in this day, to, to make those choices, to reaffirm those choices, to, to trust in the living God, to trust and to love Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, and, and spirit to make that a, a very real choice, just a, not a, a lip service choice, but a real choice. 
responsible in, in light of God's holiness, knowing that, that he is jealous for you. He, he wants you. And he's done what it's made, and he's done through Jesus what it takes to, to have you as one of his children. But we have to do the repentance part. We have to choose to, to repent. God will never force us to repent. God is good. He loves us. His faithfulness will endure forever. Let's rely on him. And close in prayer with me. Precious God and Heavenly Father, thank you again for your faithfulness. Thank you again for, for what you do for us each and every day. Your, your common grace, your sustaining grace is amazing. We don't have to, to think about breathing. We don't have to be cognizant of, of making our heart beat. Uh, we, unless there's a problem, we don't have to think about walking or our, our movement. Uh, we have to rely on you and give you thanks for what you do just in us every, other, every moment of every day. But God, you have gone beyond that to share the, the truth of your, your special grace with us through the scripture and through Jesus Christ. So help us uh, to not take that lightly, to, to truly dive into that and to continue to choose to follow you, to choose to worship you, to choose to make you the treasure of our lives and our eternity. Thank you for what's going to happen during these summer weeks. And we pray that you would keep us close to your heart, draw us close and give us a hunger for for worship, whether that be in a live setting or to continue to, to get on the, the computer, on the television, to, to hear your truth all summer long during these weeks. Lord, thank you for this day. We praise you for who you are and who you will always be. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. Make a, a great week, and we'll see you soon.